Susan, we I'm just so excited to find out what things have emerged from you since our last conversation about creativity. There's been a lot happening, dramatic changes in the in the environment in all sorts of ways. So, what, you know, so let's start by by talking about what's changed for you, what's emerged. Yeah, I think it's such a challenging time for creatives that really rely on an audience and suddenly everything we were doing, either book signings or speaking or art shows are all canceled. And so I think it's been really challenging on the psyche, even for an introvert like me, to deal with this new way of, of relating. And so, so you can only do so much online and still have that same impact. So I think we are stretching the limits of you know, trying to find ways to create this authentic, real human interaction over, over electronic communication. Yeah, it, that, that reminds me about the importance of presence and being visible in not only, well, I suppose what you're saying is that you had all these physical opportunities to be present that were taken away and then the online space, that the presence and the visibility online, are we saying it's like not, the impact of that is not as great as if you were able to do those signings on, you know, face to face? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the reality is so much of communication happens between the events, the chit chat, the small talk, the, uh, that sort of thing goes away. And I think it's really in those one-on-one -on -one brief interactions where we learn so much valuable information about each other and where you get the sense of the true person. And I think without that ability, with, that, with, with just sort of being very aware that you're on camera at a certain time, I think that some of the natural uh, communication doesn't happen so much online. Mm, yeah. And so the impact of everything that's happened, it's, has it ha made a deep impact on your presence overall? I think just like everybody else, I'm still trying to figure out how to make the, make the transition to more of an online presence than an in-person presence. I, all of us are learning technology at, you know, new, new and different rates. And we're, we're learning the importance of video in attracting clients. And I think it's, it's, we're, it's just a learning curve and some are keeping up really well. And I feel like I'm sort of struggling to, to make that transition. Last time I spoke with you, you were talking about um, stepping out of academia. Has that happened? Yes, I did. I left last summer. And so I've been working for myself for a whole year now, over a year. And um, challenges and obstacles, of course, I, I said goodbye to predictable income for unpredictable income. And what a crazy time to have done that, given everything shutting down. Uh, couldn't have foreseen that. Uh, but again, how do you transition? How do you make the situation work for you? So that's what I'm trying to do right now is just trying to find my, find my way like so many. And uh, so it's been, uh, it's been an interesting, an interesting time. <laughs> yes. And there's just so much uncertainty and in a way that uncertainty gives a very rich environment for creativity to occur. And at the same time, there needs to be a certain kind of safety net, doesn't there? Yeah. And it's, I think that's always the artist's balance is how can you, how can you balance the income with the, with the creative stuff? If it was my wish, I'd be in the studio every day, but sometimes you have to be in the office to get things listed. If nobody can buy it if it's not listed online for sale. Um, nobody can read your book unless you put it out there. So I think we're, I think the whole world seems to be in sort of this depressive funk right now. And I, I see it in so many people that are otherwise so, so joyous. And I see this sort of din in, of, of noise in the world. And 
I think that does affect all of us in different ways. I think artists are, tend to be very sensitive people. And so we're sort of internalizing all of this and it's either coming out in our art or it's coming out in our relationships where we're digesting and dealing with it in different ways. I find I'm writing more than I have before because it's almost like I'm having a conversation with either the characters in creative writing or, you know, with a, with a mythical audience out there. Right. And I suppose your positioning is important as well. Like your presence in academia and now that you're not in academia, you know, has that led to emergence of maybe different opportunities that weren't available to you when you were um, having to spend so much of your time doing the academic work? I definitely feel a sense of freedom. It's probably the best thing that has come from stepping aside from higher education. I find that I am not so regulated to the wee hours of the morning to paint, or I don't have to wait for creative bursts because I can sort of micro create those on my own. And yes, it's not, I always felt like I was trying to, to cram in my creative endeavors instead of now they're unfolding much more naturally. Um, again, there's, a, there's a, a mix of urgency for you know, livelihood, always sort of trying to make everything you're doing commercially viable. And that might be the downside, is that some of the joy of, of, of creating is sacrificed for the actual, you have to, it's a commercial product, you have to sell it. That's right. Yeah, we've we've spoken about this um, with others as well about passion. When passion is commercialized, it takes away something, doesn't it? You know the. It does. It does, and it's it's not necessarily all bad, but it's it's definitely you have to. This is why sometimes artists have such trouble pricing their work, because they be, get an emotional attachment to it in the creation of it. And um, how can you put a price tag on this piece of whatever? And so we, we find that there, there is sort of an emotional something that, that is a little clouded and a little skewed when suddenly everything you, you're putting out is potentially for sale. So I find one of the ways to curb that is when I sit down to do a piece, if it's not a custom order, is um, just to remind myself to have fun and that this can turn out awful. It doesn't have to be something that's for sale. It can just be for me. And so it's a little psychological game I play with myself, but sometimes that's freeing and sometimes the work is better. Right, and then you know, when, when you're creating your artwork, sometimes there is like that end in mind that are you, is the purpose of it, or is it commercial or is it simply for your own pleasure? And I suppose that has an impact on what you create as well. And is that what you mean when you say you play a game for yourself, that you, you tell yourself that it's simply for yourself, but actually you know, your intention is to sell it? Yeah, I, I guess by giving myself permission for it not to be a masterpiece or not to be something that uh, has the quality or the standards that I normally have for my work by allowing myself to just say, have fun. Um, this doesn't have to be something you sell. This can just be an experiment or this can just be something that, that you end up loving that you can hang in your studio. By playing that game with myself, sometimes the work is even much better than had I said, all right, this needs to be a commercially viable piece. This needs to be in this price range. Um, you know, if I can get out of my head a little, um, sometimes the work is just better. And in earlier conversations, you've spoken about how some of your paintings, when they hang up in hotel rooms, you, your intention is that people will feel calm when, when they see your paintings. And so the impact is uh, the feelings that people will have when they, when they witness your, your creativity. And when you start with that end in mind of like the impact that your, your creativity is going to create, does that have an impact on your presence as well? Like, do you change 
in terms of the essence of your presence when you're creating something? Well, the, the, the long answer is that, or the short answer rather, is that it doesn't really matter to me the context except that I want to make people feel, I want to make people get out of their immediate environment or their immediate stress and be able to look at something and say, oh, that's cool or that makes me feel happier. It doesn't even have to be a real logical response uh, or, or um, an articulate response to the, to the piece, but I want to make them feel. That's, that's sort of essential to, to everything I guess I do, whether it's my characters in a, in a creative writing or a play or, um, or my stories in my you know, nonfiction books. I, the, the end goal is to make people feel. And, but I think the, the, the long answer is that, especially when I know where that piece is going, I just did a piece for a, a bed and breakfast and they said this, this was going to hang in their, their entryway as a greeting to their, well, if you know that, then of course you paint a little bit more intentionally. So of course, you know, a long road ended up emerging in the piece because this was an off the beaten path kind of bed and breakfast. And it was a journey to get there. So the landscape naturally, you know, came to be in this piece. So um, always the goal to make people feel, even if I'm not sure where that piece is gonna end up. Right, yeah, so that visual presence causes them to enter almost a different dimension, doesn't it? Yes. And then we think about our presence physically. So at the moment you're adapting to an online presence as not able to be physically present. And then we're talking about the visual presence of your artwork and you know the, the cognitive presence, the metaphysical presence and and how do we how do we combine all of those different presences together to cause an impact that is desirable? Yeah, I think that starts with really knowing who you are and what you're essentially about. And I know early in my art career, I was all over the map with what I was doing because I was still experimenting. I was still trying to find my, my voice. I found I was good at lots of different medias, but I wasn't quite sure uh, where I wanted to land and, and focus on. So I think knowing who you are, essentially, I think that voice comes through no matter what you're doing. But it's, it's I think it's something that comes with age, uh, something that comes over, over a great deal of time to be able to look back and just see uh, what, how you've evolved. But I, I, I think it has to start with knowing yourself. And knowing yourself and, and knowing your audience as well, I suppose, knowing... Yes. With. Yes, I, I never know quite who's buying my art, but I always know that they loved it. There was a reason that it was purchased. Uh, often they will send in comments before they've even received the piece. Oh, I just love this piece. I can see it in my dining room. I can see it in my office. And so the fact that they have made that connection to the piece before it's even in their hands is is quite remarkable to me. It's it's probably the it's, it's the best compliment you could give an artist. And a lot of um, making art public, as opposed to simply doing it for our own pleasure, it's very much about building relationships. And you're having to build relationships with people that you will never meet, building relationships with people that you will never see, people that you. Um, you know, you, you can't imagine because you just don't know who's going to buy your work. So at the same time, it's like they already exist in somewhere, you know, and it's like making your presence and their presence, like building the bridges between the two, isn't it? And seeing like how these, how the communication emerges to connect, to make those connections between your, yourself and your potential buyers. Yeah, and it's, um, how do we do that? That it, It's probably happening in ways that we don't even realize that it's happening. It's a particular hue in a painting that somebody 
latches onto and that reminds them. I, I paint with this green, for instance, that I, I remember this round plastic uh, outdoor table on our back patio when I was growing up. I couldn't have been more than three or four, but this bright green plastic table we thought was so cool back then. And that color green sort of is emblazoned on my memory. And so sometimes I will pull out that green because it just makes me happy. That could be the very thing that somebody's connecting to within a painting. And we don't know why. We don't know why we have an emotional connection to that color, but we do. And um, that can be this kind of silent stuff that we never know how we're connecting with somebody. But I do think that between the color and the form and the size, or even just the title or description of a piece, something connects with someone and they can they 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 need to be a part of that image uh almost as though that image that artwork becomes a, a little piece of their own story and yeah and, and it's all about stories within stories within stories isn't it like you have a story about that color green and somebody else will have a maybe a very different story about the color green but there's some sort of connection between these different stories that make up the jigsaw piece. Yes, yes. If you talk to um, if you talk to people in terms of their favorite cartoons when they were a kid, they will often place themselves in a particular spot in a home, uh, or or associate a, a television show with the time of day. I remember getting off the school bus and watching. Um, I think it was Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch um, until mom got home from work. And so I associate those with a particular time in my childhood. And I think when we, when we use metaphors like that, and then so the, the television shows become a metaphor for, or, or a symbol for a particular time in someone's life, I think, boy, we just made a connection based on a on a television show, but it's much more than that. And so the same thing I think is with art. We make a connection, but it's much larger than that little moment. Hmm. And, and also like you, you refer to stories from your past and they have a presence because they still influence you. And there are stories about our future as well stories that are imagined and they also have an inf the presence of these stories that we imagine about our future also have an impact on us because they may be inspiring us to take certain actions and that leads to emergence of you know connections and opportunities and spaces that wouldn't exist unless we had imagined Yeah, and I, I, I often uh, think of life as handing us little clues or little, little signs about maybe what we're supposed to be doing or where we're supposed to be going. And uh, I couple that with that creative presence, as you say. I think it creates this, this full picture for us. I'm, I'm, I'm certain that we are largely unaware of the things that are impacting us. I think if we're really honest, sometimes we don't know how we got where we are, or we don't understand exactly what led us to do something. But we were sort of sensitive to uh, the changes around us, the, the conversations, the, the little signs uh, that life gives us every day. And so when, if you're a person of faith, you might see that as divine intervention. If you're um, with, without a particular faith, you might just see that as the universe calling to you. But something's happening. And I think those that can latch, th those that are most aware of those things are probably more successful in, in connecting all the dots. Hmm. Yeah, because there's so many different dimensions to life, isn't there? You know, there's, there's the physical dimension and then there's you know the universe as you, you you say and and there's so many there's so much that is unknown to us and we just don't know how that un those unknown influences whether they're unconscious or whether they are just beyond our realm of awareness that we don't know the influence yeah and i think i think here's a whole conversation about about you know how we're wired personal preference um, 
I think those that are most successful are really in tune with how they work best. And uh, for instance, I no longer work in the middle of the night. I used to, I used to, when I was younger, get a creative inspiration and just get out of bed and go to it. Uh, the older you get, you value every, every hour of sleep you can get wherever you can get it. And uh, so I don't do that so much anymore, but now I'm a 5 a.m. person. I was never a 5 a.m. person before. Seven was more my speed. So now I find that it's just shifted. And so now I become much more regular and ordinary about my schedule. But there is something, again, if you look at highly successful people, almost all of them have a structure to their day. Almost all of them have a routine, a habit that, that keeps them sort of grounded and able to keep you know, putting out the work. So I, I think we ought not to negate our personal preferences. That's how we're wired. That's, that's how we were born. And I think a lot of people say, oh, I want to look like this or I want to fit into this box. And so they negate those little things about their preference, time of day that they work best, things that they like to eat, um, temperature that they like to be in, the landscape that they like to look at as they work. I think all of that's really important and a lot of people just dismiss that as unimportant. I think that's vitally important how we're wired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there are environments in which we thrive and environments that are hostile for us, whereas for, for somebody else it might be you know, a, a wonderful environment, but yes. we just don't thrive in it. Right. And so, you know, the current pandemic has led to emergence of so many different situations and limitations and obstacles and maybe like the environment is harsher and more hostile than it was a year ago so you know in terms of that like being a creative artist how do you how do you navigate that you know how do you manage your presence in a in an environment which may be more hostile than normal well, it, it, that's, a, that's a great question because I think we're forced right now to think about our daily needs, right? Income, water, air. It's sort of survivalist mentality in, on some level that maybe we didn't think we'd ever live to see. Uh, and then we couple that with the need for, the need for art. And, and, I, and I talk about it as a need because I think aesthetics, the, the, you know, the study of, of beauty, beautification, I think that's not an optional thing. I hear so many times people say, well, we're, we're just going to, we're going to cut back on our entertainment budget or we're not going to, we're not going to buy, you know, stuff for the home anymore. But I say that it's the stuff that you surround yourself with that impacts your view of the world, that, that can help you to think more positively, can inspire you to think higher thoughts and, and get more done. And so I think that it's, it's unfortunately a time where people are starting to, to cut those things that they view as optional. But I never think that artistic things are optional. I think it's the, the need to express how we're feeling for, for, for first and foremost, it's really important to, for everyone to be talking about how they're feeling. I think mental health is um, more important than ever. And I think there's a real connection between mental health and the arts, which would be a whole nother show. <laughs> but uh, I think that, that art isn't optional. Art is a fundamental part of our expressive nature. And if you look at every culture um, th throughout history, every culture expresses itself, has that innate tendency towards self-expression, whether we saw it in early man with hieroglyphics, uh, music, dance, it's everywhere. And so I think that shows us that, that we were born to be expressive creatures and that that's not an option. That's not, that's not optional. And not everybody is as expressive as others, but everybody has creativity. Everybody can express themselves. And everybody has the need to do that. It's just not some people have the need to do it more than others. And I suppose in times of crisis throughout history, 
it leads to the emergence of a different kind of expression of art and yeah i mean if you suddenly if all your instruments are made out of bamboo and your bamboo crop is wiped out you're going to find some other source to make your instruments out of i think that's exactly sort of the analogy for what uh, public speakers, for instance, are dealing with right now. You know, every speaking gig in 2020 was canceled. So now I have all of this material prepared. I have all of this ability. How do I use it? So I just started to put out some video content. Um, I started to connect with other speakers. And, you, you know, I find myself evolving. It's not ideal. It's not what I would like to do. I'm much more a one-on-one -on -one kind of person but you evolve and you adapt. And I would say that that's how civilization has done it all these years. Mm, right. And so instead of being on stage with an audience, we have to be on stage online. And maybe the, the impact of our online presence is not going to be, it's going to lead to an emergence of very different things compared with if you were speaking on stage in, in the physical realm, right? Yeah, because you know when I'm when I'm on video, people can pause it. They can, you know, they can leave the room. They can. It's much more of a. It's much more of a, the buy-in isn't as much. You're not. You're not on camera. Just the person is on camera, right? So I'm a viewer. I'm watching. Uh, they're not on camera so much. So the 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 ability to be to get someone in thoroughly entirely engaged is much harder um, online it's just easy to mentally check out check your cell phone be in keep multitasking so I would argue that it's an opportunity for speakers to really hone their craft and uh, to, to work on their storytelling and to really engage people and and grip them right from the beginning all of the stuff we used to be so concerned with in public speaking um, that has sort of fallen by the wayside. Smoke and mirrors and video and special effects and all of that might have become more important than the actual message. And I think it's forcing speakers to get back to the message, which is a good, a good result. Right. And I suppose, you know, since social media and we have all these influencers on YouTube, influencers on Twitter, influencers on Instagram, you know, and all of these influencers, they have a tremendous amount of presence, and yet they may never have spoken publicly on a stage in front of an audience. They're, they're only ever speaking to the camera. Yeah, and uh, you know, I sort of admire those people that ha are have been able to to take a plat a free platform like Instagram and get thousands of followers and to put out very little content, just a picture a day, a quote, uh, some sort of funny meme, and th they have created massive followings. There's something sim simplistic about that that I really like and admire. It's not you know, just Instagram in and of itself, if you really break it down, it's a very simple platform. Um, and so it has its limitations, but uh, it, it, it also, it has a real, it, it's, clearly it's grown in the, during the pandemic. It's, its usership is way up during the pandemic. So it, it, we know that something's working there. Likewise with Zoom, you know, like yeah. um, maybe like, Five years ago, people didn't know what Zoom was, and now, you know, everyone from education to industry is using Zoom just like they're using their yes. mobile phones. Yes, and you know what else it's done? It it's it's caused us to think about um, the the price tag we put on things. For instance, I know that lots of companies. I'm not sure if Zoom is one of them. But I know that lots of companies have made their platforms free. And b b because there's something about the, the good of it, right? Just doing it for the good of it. I know that they have simultaneously found out ways to, to, to profit also. Uh, but there's a lot of 
uh, generosity that I see in the world in terms of companies giving away things. I've even done some, some meetings online just for free, just because I can, because I'm at home. And it's not costing me anything but an hour of my time. Um, so why not engage in something, have a conversation, do an interview with somebody who, you know, normally might have paid me. I'm just going to do it for free because I can. And I, I see a lot of that. And that's like the best of the human spirit that, that I like to see. But it causes us to then think about the value, just like when MIT and Harvard and, and all of these big schools put their entire curriculum online for free, it sort of leveled the playing field. We sort of saw higher education in a different light, right? We, we st sort of started to think about, is the higher education paradigm still valid, which I know we talked about last time, but I think the, the question is still valid. And so how do you price something? How do you make a profit from something? Um, and I think people are having different conversations about what ought to be free, what, what other people are doing for free. How does this impact what I'm, I'm pricing my own stuff at? And, and then just the larger question about the value of content uh, for content creators. That's, um, that's, a, that's a big discussion. Mm, that's true. That's right. And, and I suppose when you know, Zoom or Facebook or Instagram, they are offering their services for free, they are creating a presence through the value that they are adding to our lives. Their presence is felt. We, you know, we, we know who they are and we, they become an integral part of our life. So we're, we're allowing them to take up that space in our lives. And um, so it becomes um, like a reciprocal thing in a, in a sense, because because we're we're using zoom they're allowed to sell some services of it you know if we weren't using it they wouldn't be known and therefore they wouldn't be able to make the profit that they're making from the other services that they sell so it's like a, a mutual thing isn't it right and i think i i suppose that the long-term marketing strategy is that when life gets back to normal if it gets back to normal then um, they have created this desire and this need for the product and then maybe it's no longer free but people can't live without it so they've created the need for it and they can't live without it and so therefore then when they when they start to charge again um, people will buy because they've come to rely on it that's a that's a really it's a great marketing strategy yeah yeah, because we've allowed it to become an integral part of our life that, as you say, we can't, you know, we, it becomes uh, an essential. Yes. Yes. So I think the goal for speakers and artists and writers is to put out enough content so that we feel that when the pandemic is over, that we're still needed, we're still desired, that people have come to rely on our stuff for their well-being. Mm, our presence is associated with value. You know, if we can make our presence felt in a way that it's truly adding value to people's lives, making a positive impact, that will integrally lead to emergence of other opportunities to add more value. Yes, yes. To summarize then, Susan, to summarize presence, emergence and impact. So in your work, what do those three themes mean to you? Presence is, you know, learning how to adapt to whatever life gives you and still being able to, to, to be in people's lives, whether it's virtually or um, through the written word or through the, the visual image to, to still be present. Um, I think our impact is, is, is as much about us as it is about our viewer, our, our audience. And sometimes we will connect in ways that we're not sure about. Uh, we're not sure why somebody resonates with that piece. It could be as simple as color, could be as simple as the form that it takes, but we have a, sh a mutual shared connection through that, that one thing. And then, uh, so that's impact and uh, presence. What was the other? Emergence. 
emergent. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that we as people need to keep uh, expressing ourselves in ways that allow us to keep emerging new ideas, new forms, new thoughts. And so um, I think that we self-limit and that we ought to maybe take into account more of our own, how we're wired, our personal preferences, our likes, our dislikes, uh, so that we can forge a, a, a better or stronger connection with the world by being more aware of who we are. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Susan. It's been a pleasure speaking thank with you. Thank you. Again. Likewise. I'll speak with you soon. Bye for now. Okay. Very good. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.